Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. We talk a lot about horror on this channel, but the real horror out there is how easy it is for your data to fall in the hands of disreputable people. That's why today's video is sponsored by Aura. While you're enjoying today's spooky video, data brokers, those things that go bump on the web, could already be selling your information to scanners, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, your health records, your relatives, they could all be out there. That's why I've been using Aura. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests just for me. It was simple to use and very intuitive, and I had barely gotten out of the setup process, and it was already blocking over 20 data broker requests on my behalf. Aura protects your passwords, your banking information, everything you need for day-to-day -day online life. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use my information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, other sensitive information, things like a certain YouTube channel that you all enjoy listening to so much. Aura also does much more to protect me and my family from online threats, the kind you can't see. It comes with other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It really is just that easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. I hear you saying, but Dr. Plague, I have one or two of these tools already. But, dear readers, not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Readers of my fine tales can tell you why that never ends well. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping me safe so I can focus on other tasks like finishing my latest book or uploading my most recent video. I value my privacy, and I know you value yours. You can go to Aura.com, that's A-U-R-A dot com, to start your two-week free trial. You can also check out the link below and start your free trial with Aura. So why not give Aura a try and protect yourself from the real monsters out there? There are a few places you know where you shouldn't bleed, I'm sure. Shark-infested waters, anywhere in bear country, and in polite company. Sure, but you're forgetting the Midwest. It's pretty much bred into us, even though we don't see it directly when growing up. You come back inside for dinner when the bell rings, or mom screams bloody murder over whatever game you're playing in the woods or the corn. If your parents are generous, you can go out after dark and catch fireflies. But make sure you wear your shoes. Don't go too close to the woods, or a branch might poke your eye out. All that sort of talk. What they don't tell you, or even usually know in earnest, is that you shouldn't bleed after dark. It's not the predators, mind you. The worst we have here are coyotes, and they're usually more afraid of you than you are of them. Usually, there's a few examples of kids being ripped apart by then, but those rarely reach the news because something else is actually to blame. A satanic ritual where the kids rip the child in question apart while their own tears stream in fat rivulets while their friends screamed for mercy and their parents listened horrified but understandingly from a balcony not a quarter mile away. The parents never blame the children for what they had done to survive in this place. Something made them know that it had to be done. You see, the land once belonged to the natives. They walked this land and knew its habits and its hungers. They knew how to appease it, how to placate it long enough so that its hunger wouldn't consume them whole. The white men came barreling in here thinking they knew how to appease it, and ironically, we accidentally did. Pig farms, you see, generate a lot of blood. Blood that must be drained, and this blood might as well be processed into fertilizer. This blood placates the soil here, which hungers for a blood of any type. It's a good source of nitrogen, some farmers say, but the old farmers, more gristle than muscle, remember what it really is. It's a sacrifice to the land. So, 
let me tell you a story from my childhood as to why you should never bleed after dark in the Midwest. I was 13, my cousin Zach was 14, and my friend was about the same age. My mom let us go collect fireflies after dark, which is harmless enough. The land is usually quite respectful of property, and my mother, like her mother's mother, buried those witch bottles filled with piss after childbirth with nails and broken glass around the edges of the property to demarcate the family domain. It's hollowed the ground, though our ignorant children's minds didn't register her declaration that we were only safe on family property. My cousin Zach was the one to dare us into the field beyond the farm. I knew better, or at least I should have, but after a triple dog dare, the most sacred of all dares, I went first into the cutting dry corn husks of late September. I felt them scratch me as I ran into the forest of uniform corn stalks. Despite the minuscule pain, I giggled knowing that I was breaking one of my mother's biggest rules. Do not enter the cornfield after dark, or you'll get lost. I was a smart kid, and I knew this because everyone told me so, so I figured I could find my way back. The moon was high, and if I just headed away from it, then I'd be fine. I heard my friends come charging in behind me, laughing and scrambling through the razor-sharp corn, but not quite behind me. I looked down at my arms and saw tiny, slightly bloody scratches along them, and could only imagine that I had them on my shins and face as well. The worst cut was on my left outside wrist, and I caught the sight of the first rivulet of blood falling almost in slow motion as it fell to the dry and thirsty soil below me. Even in the moonlight, I could see that that was where the blood had hit the soil, cratering it. The soil around it darkened dramatically, as if I poured a bottle of water into it, and the soil, the best I can describe it, is that it drank me in. It knew me now. My blood ran cold, and I shouted out to my friends and to Zack that I thought we should leave. As the purple vines began spilling up from that first drop, it became an existential fear in me. I bolted back the way I'd come. I know I was only a dozen rows or so inside the field, but as I ran and ran, I quickly became aware that either I was running in the wrong direction, or that suddenly direction was meaningless. The soil had tasted my blood, and it would have me. I'll, I'll spare you the details, but give you the highlights and let you fill in the rest. I'm sure that whatever you imagine is only half as awful as what I saw that night. First, I came across Zack. He was bleeding all over from faint scratches that bled more than they had any right to do, and I knew that the land would never let him leave. He had stripped off his bloody long sleeve shirt to inspect where exactly he was bleeding from. He was more perplexed than anything and obliviously told me that I had lost the game of hide and seek since he was the seeker. I put on his blood soaked shirt and sprinted through the corn. The sound of him screaming to come back here in anger followed by the shrieking pain he must have felt as the husk ripped his skin from him with every step. It'll haunt me forever. Despite himself, he couldn't help but follow the blood on his shirt until every piece of him was skinned away by the blades we ran through. Next, my best friend. I keep his name a secret so as to keep him safe, but I found him digging a hole to escape the sharp edges around him. I told him to stop digging because the very soil below him wanted him. That's what my mom used to say, anyway. He curled into a ball, afraid to move an inch, lest one of the stalks come closer to him. I told him I'd get help and to stay as still as he could. Lastly, I saw a glowing flame. I ran towards it, my cousin's long sleeve shirt protecting me from the lashing leaves and jagged soil when I tripped. Blood still dripped from painless razor cuts all across me, but not as badly as Zack. When I arrived, my mom was already gone. She sat there on her knees, holding something I can only hope was not a baby, smoldering amidst a circle of burning corn stalks that 
seemed to never run out of fuel. My throat was choked with the scent of my mother's burning hair, and my eyes streamed with both the smoke and my abysmal feeling of loss and loneliness. I ran, I ran, and I ran, and I awoke my father when I broke through the forest of corn, screaming bloody murder. My, my mother was dead, my cousin was bleeding, and my best friend was hiding in a hole. At the end of it, my mother was proclaimed missing, though everyone in town showed it in their eyes that they both pitied me and respected my mother's sacrifice. My best friend was committed to an institute for a while, and we fell apart, but he lived. My cousin, on the other hand, was, according to the news, ripped apart by coyotes. So, thus the whole county went hunting for coyotes, shooting them dead, burning them, leaving them to rot. Do you see what I mean? Zack and my mother were only pawns in the end. The land got the blood of a thousand coyotes out of this little adventure, but one problem remains. Despite my mother's knowledge of the old ways, the land remembers my taste. I was driving back home to see my dad after years away from this awful place. I hit a pothole the size of Kansas that took my front tire clean off. My phone calls and texts won't go through. My phone's been at 23% for entirely too long. It has easily been days, but nothing has changed. The sky is still black. The moon is the same as it had been when I left years ago. The clock hasn't moved an inch, but I know only how long it's been because of sleep, hunger, and thirst. I have a middling understanding of tech and have wrote a script to post this message once my laptop gets signal again. The corn grows so close to these roads and only seems to grow closer the further down the road I look. It will know my taste again. I'm coming, Zach. If you get this message, friend, know that this country knows your taste, and you are more than welcome to come here and feed it. Run away to the desert. It's not safe to bleed here. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead and Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. And thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Sarah SMR42, Grim Reaper, and Tomboy Top Uwu for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a special thanks to Grim Reaper, who appears to have subscribed not just on YouTube, but also on my Patreon. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you, and your support is always appreciated. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon, or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early, at 8.30 a.m., as opposed to 8.30 p.m., my time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book, anytime I write one, on your doorstep in, hopefully, a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>